Section 8 of the Aeneid. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Peter Meshkoff. The Aeneid by Virgil. Translated by J.W. McHale, Book 4, The Love of Dido and Her End, Part 2. But good Aeneas, though he would fain soothe and comfort her grief, and talk away her distress with many a sigh, and melted in his soul by great love, yet fulfills the divine commands and returns to his fleet. Then indeed the Teucrians set to work, and haul down their tall ships all along the shore. The hulls are oiled and afloat, they carry from the woodland green boughs for oars, and massy logs unhewn, in hot haste to go. One might descry them shifting their quarters and pouring out of all the town, even as ants, mindful of winter, plunder a great heap of wheat and store it in their house. A black column advances on the plain as they carry home their spoil on a narrow track through the grass. Some shove and strain their shoulders at big grains. Some marshal the ranks and chastise delay. All the path is a swarm with work. What then were thy thoughts, O Dido, as thou sawst it? What sighs didst thou utter, viewing from the fortress roof the broad beach a swarm, and seeing before thine eyes the whole sea stirred with their noisy din? Injurious love, to what dost thou not compel mortal hearts? Again she must needs break into tears, again essay entreaty, and bow her spirit down to love, not to leave aught untried, and go de to death in vain. Anna! Thou seest the bustle that fills the shore. They have gathered round from every quarter. Already their canvas woos the breezes, and the merry sailors have garlanded the sterns. This great pain, my sister, I shall have the strength to bear, as I have had the strength to foresee. Yet this one thing, Anna, for love and pity's sake, for of thee alone was the traitor fain. To thee even his secret thoughts were confided. Alone thou knewest his moods and tender fits. Go, my sister, and humbly accost the haughty stranger. I did not take the Grecian oath in Oilus to root out the race of Troy. I sent no fleet against her fortresses. Neither have I disentombed his father and she's ashes and ghost, that he should refuse my words entrance to his stubborn ears. Whither does he run? Let him grant this grace, alas, the last, to his lover, and await fair winds and an easy passage. No more do I pray for the old delusive marriage, nor that he give up fair Latium and abandon a kingdom. A breathing space, I ask, to give my madness rest and room, till my very fortune teach my grief submission. This last favor I implore, sister be pitiful, grant this to me and I will restore it in full measure when I die. So she pleaded, and so her sister carries and recarries the piteous tale of weeping. But by no weeping is he stirred, inflexible to all the words he hears. Fate withstands and lays divine bars on unmoved mortal ears. Even as when the eddying blasts of northern alpine winds are emulous to uproot the secular strength of a mighty oak, it wails on, and the trunk quivers and the high foliage strews the ground. The tree clings fast on the rocks, and high as her top soars into heaven, so deep strike her roots to hell. Even thus is the hero buffeted with changeful, perpetual accents, and distress thrills his mighty breast, while his purpose stays unstirred, and his tears fall in vain. Then indeed, hapless and dismayed by doom, Dido prays for death, and is weary of gazing on the arch of heaven. The more to make her fulfill her purpose and quit the light, she saw, when she laid her gifts on the altars alight with incense, awful to tell, the holy streams blacken, and the wine turns as it poured into ghastly blood. Of this sight she spoke to none, no, not to her sister. Likewise there was within the house a marble temple of her ancient lord, kept of her in marvelous honor and fastened with snowy fleeces and festal boughs. Forth of it she seemed to hear her husband's voice crying and calling when night was dim upon the earth, and alone on the housetops the screech owl often made moan with funeral note 
and long-drawn sobbing cry. Therewithal many a warning of wizards of old terrifies her with appalling presage. In her sleep fierce Aeneas drives her wildly, and ever she seems being left by herself alone, ever going uncompanioned on a weary way, and seeking her Tyrians in a solitary land. Even as frantic Pentheus sees the arrayed furies in a double sun, and Thebes shows herself twofold to his eyes, or Agamemnonian Orestes, renowned in tragedy, when his mother pursues him armed with torches and dark serpents, and the fatal sisters crouch avenging in the doorway. So when, overcome by her pangs, she caught the madness and resolved to die, she works out secretly the time and fashion, and accosts her sorrowing sister with mean hiding her design and hope calm on her brow. I have found a way, mine own, wish me joy, sister-like, to restore him to me, or release me of my love for him. Hard by the ocean limit and the set of sun as the extreme Ethiopian land, where ancient Atlas turns on his shoulders the starred burning axle-tree of heaven. Out of it hath been shown to me a priestess of Massilian race, warder of the temple of the Hesperides, even she who gave the dragon his food and kept the holy boughs on the tree, sprinkling clammy honey and slumberous poppy seed. She professes with her spells to relax the purposes of whom she will, but on others to bring passion and pain, to stay the river waters and turn the stars backward. She calls up ghosts by night. Thou shalt see the earth moaning underfoot and mountain ashes descending from the hills. I take heaven, sweet, to witness, and thee, mine own darling sister, I do not willingly arm myself with the arts of magic. Do thou secretly raise a pyre in the inner court, and let them lay on it the arms that the accursed one left hanging in our chamber, and all the dress he wore, and the bridal bed where I fell. It is good to wipe out all the wretch's traces, and the priestess orders thus. So speaks she, and is silent, while pallor overruns her face. Yet Anna deems not her sister veils death behind these strange rites, and grasps not her wild purpose, nor fears aught deeper than at Sicius's death. So she makes ready as bidden. But the queen, the pyre being built up of piled faggots and sawn ilex in the innermost of her dwelling, hangs the room with chaplets and garlands it with funeral boughs. On the pillow she lays the dress he wore, the sword he left, and an image of him knowing what was to come. Altars are reared around, and the priestess, with hair undone, thrice peals from her lips the hundred gods of Erebus and Chaos, and the triform Hecate, the triple-faced maidenhood of Diane. Likewise she had sprinkled pretended water of Avernus's spring, and rank herbs are sought mown by moonlight with brazen sickles, dark with milky venom, and sought is the talisman torn from a horse's forehead at birth, ere the dam could snatch it. Herself, the holy cake in her pure hands, hard by the altars, with one foot unshod and garments flowing loose, she invokes the gods ere she die, and the stars that know of doom, then prays to whatsoever deity looks in righteousness and remembrance on lovers ill allied. Night fell, weary creatures took quiet slumber all over the earth, and woodland and wild waters had sunk to rest. Now the stars wheel midway on their gliding path. Now all the country is silent, and beasts and gay birds that haunt liquid levels of lake or thorny rustic thicket lay couched asleep under the still night. But not so the distressed Phoenician, nor does she ever sink asleep or take the night upon eyes or breast. Her pain redoubles and her love swells to renewed madness as she tosses on the strong tide of wrath. Even so she begins, and thus revolves with her heart alone. See, what shall I do? Shall I again make trial of mine own wooers that will scorn me, and stoop to sue for a Numidian marriage among those whom already, over and over, I have disdained for husbands? Then shall I follow the Ilian fleets and the uttermost bidding of the Teucrians? because it is good to think they were once raised up by my succor, 
or the grace of mine own kindness is fresh in their remembrance? And how should they let me if I would, or take the odious woman on their haughty ships? Art thou ignorant on me, even in rune, and knowest not yet the forsworn race of Laomedon? And then shall I accompany the triumphant sailors, a lonely fugitive, or plunge forth, girt with all my Tyrian train, so hardly severed from Sidon's city, shall I again drive them seaward, and bid them spread their sails to the tempest? Nay, diest thou, as thou deservest, and let the steel end thy pain. With thee it began, overborne by my tears, thou, O my sister, dost load me with this madness and agony, and layest me open to the enemy. I could not spend a wild life without stain, far from the bridal chamber, and free from touch of distress like this. O oh, faith ill-kept, that was plighted to Sychaeus's ashes! Thus her heart broke in long lamentation. Now Aeneas was fixed to go, and now, with all set duly in order, was taking hasty sleep on his high stern. To him as he slept, the god appeared once again in the same fashion of countenance, and thus seemed to renew his warning, in all points like to Mercury, voice and hue and golden hair and limbs, gracious in youth. Goddess born, canst thou sleep on in such danger, and cease not the coming perils that hem thee in, madman, nor hearest the breezes blowing fair? She, fixed on death, is revolving craft and crime grimly in her bosom, and swells the changing surge of wrath. Fliest thou not headlong, while headlong flight is yet possible? Even now wilt thou see the ocean weltering with broken timbers, see the fierce glare of torches, and the beach in a riot of flame, if dawn break on thee yet dallying in this land. Up ho! Linger no more. Woman is ever a fickle and changing thing. So spoke he, and melted in the black night. Then indeed Aeneas, startled by the sudden phantom, leaps out of slumber and bestirs his crew. Haste and awake, O men, and sit down to the thwarts, shake out sails speedily. A god sent from high heaven, lo, again spurs us to speed our flight and cut the twisted cables. We follow thee, holy one of heaven, whoso thou art, and again joyfully obey thy command. O be favorable, give gracious aid and bring fair sky and weather. He spoke, and snatching his sword like lightning from the sheath, strikes at the hawser with the drawn steel. The same zeal catches all at once. Rushing and tearing, they quit the shore. The sea is hidden under their fleets. Strongly they toss up the foam and sweep the blue water. And now dawn broke, and, leaving the saffron bed of Tithonus, shed her radiance anew over the world, when the queen saw from her watchtower the first light whitening, and the fleet standing out under squared sail, and discerned shore and haven empty of all their oarsmen. Thrice and four times she struck her hand on her lovely breast and rent her yellow hair. God, she cries, shall he go? Shall an alien make mock of our realm? Will they not issue an armed pursuit from all the city, and some launch ships from the dockyards? Go, bring fire in haste, serve weapons, swing out the oars. What do I talk, or where am I? What mad change is on my purpose? Alas, Dido, now thou dost feel thy wickedness that had graced thee once when thou gavest away thy crown. Behold the faith and hand of him whom, they say, carries his household's ancestral gods about with him, who stooped his shoulders to a father outworn with age. Could I not have riven his body in sunder and strewn it on the waves? and slain with the sword his comrades and his dear Ascanius, and served him for the banquet at his father's table? But the chance of battle had been dubious. If it had, whom did I fear with my death upon me? I should have borne firebrands into his camp and filled his decks with flame, blotted out father and son and race together, and flung myself atop of all. Son, whose fires lighten all the works of the world, and thou, Juno, mediatrice and witness of these my distresses, 
and Hecate, cried on by night in crossways of cities, and you, fatal avenging sisters and gods of dying Alyssa, hear me now. Bend your just deity to my woes and listen to our prayers. If must needs be that the accursed one touch his haven and float up to land, if thus Jove's decrees demand, and this the appointed term, yet, distressed in war by an armed and gallant nation, and driven homeless from his borders, rent from Ilius's embrace, let him sue for succor and see death on death untimely on his people. Nor when he hath yielded him to the terms of a harsh peace, may he have joy of his kingdom or the pleasant light. But let him fall before his day and without burial on a waste of sand. This I pray. This and my blood with it I pour for the last utterance. And you, O Tyrians, hunt his seed with your hatred for all ages to come. Send this guerdon to our ashes. Let no kindness nor truce be between nations. Arise out of our dust, O unnamed avenger, to pursue the Dardanian settlement with firebrand and steel. Now then, whensoever strength shall be given, I invoke the enmity of shore to shore, wave to water, sword to sword. Let their battles go down to their children's children. So speaks she as she kept turning her mind round about, seeking how soonest to break away from the hateful light. Thereon she speaks briefly to Bars, nurse of Sicius, for a heap of dusky ashes held her own in her country of long ago. Sweet nurse, bring Anna my sister hither to me, bid her haste and sprinkle river water over her body, and bring with her the beasts ordained for expiation. So let her come, and thou likewise veil thy brows with a pure chaplet. I would fulfill the rites of Stygian Jove that I have fitly ordered and begun, so to set the limit to my distresses and give over to the flames the funeral pyre of the Dardanian. So speaks she. The old woman went eagerly with quickened pace. But Dido, fluttered and fierce in her awful purpose, with bloodshot restless gaze and spots on her quivering cheeks burning through the pallor of imminent death, bursts into the inner courts of the house and mounts in madness the high funeral pyre and unsheaths the sword of Dardania, a gift asked for no use like this. Then after her eyes fell on the Ilian raiment and the bed she knew, dallying with her purpose through her tears, she sank on the pillow and spoke the last words of all. Dress he wore, sweet while doom and deity allowed, receive my spirit now and release me from my distresses. I have lived and fulfilled fortune's allotted course, and now I shall go a queenly phantom under the earth. I have built a renowned city, I have seen my ramparts rise. By my brother's punishment I have avenged my husband of his enemy. Happy, ah me, and over happy had but the keels of the Dardania never touched our shores. She spoke, and burying her face in the pillow, Death it will be, she cries, and unavenged, but death be it. Thus, thus it is good to pass into the dark. Let the pitiless Dardanian's gaze drink in this fire out at sea, and my death be the omen he carries on his way. She ceased, and even as she spoke, her people see her sunk on the steel, and blood reeking on the sword and spattered on her hands. A cry rises in the high halls. Rumor riots down the quaking city. The house resounds with lamentation and sobbing and bitter crying of women. Heaven echoes their loud wails, even as though all Carthage or ancient Tyre went down as the foe poured in, and the flames rolled furious over the roofs of house and temple. Swooning at the sound, her sister runs in a flutter of dismay, with torn face and smitten bosom, and darts through them all, and calls the dying woman by her name. Was it this, mine own? Was my summons a snare? Was it this thy pyre, ah me, this thine altar fires meant? How shall I begin my desolate moan? Didst thou disdain a sister's company in death? Thou shouldst have called me to share thy doom. In the selfsame hour, the selfsame pang of steel had been our portion. Did these very hands build it? Did my voice call on our father's gods? that with thee lying thus I should be away as one without pity? 
Thou hast destroyed thyself and me together, O my sister, and the Sidonian lords and people, and this thy city. Give her wounds water. I will bathe them and catch on my lips the last breath that haply yet lingers. So speaking, she had climbed the high steps and, wailing, clasped and caressed her half-lifeless sister in her bosom and staunched the dark streams of blood with her gown. She, essaying to lift her heavy eyes, swoons back. The deep-driven wound gurgles in her breast. Thrice she rose and strained to lift herself on her elbow. Thrice she rolled back on her pillow and with wandering eyes sought the light of high heaven and moaned as she found it. Then Juno omnipotent, pitying her long pain and difficult to seize, sent Iris down from heaven to unloose the struggling life from the body where it clung. For since neither by fate did she perish, nor as one who had earned her death, but woefully before her day and fired by sudden madness, not yet had Proserpine taken her lock from the golden head, nor sentenced her to the Stygian underworld. So Iris on dewy saffron pinions flits down through the sky athwart the sun in the trail of a thousand changing dyes, and stopping over her head. This hair, sacred to Dis, I take as bidden, and release thee from that body of thine. So speaks she, and cuts it with her hand, and therewith all the warmth ebbed forth from her, and the life passed away upon the winds. End of section 8 Recording by Pete Meshkoff.